And now it's time for another edition of What Would Jello Do? The Great Betrayal, Part 3. No one has ever been able to conquer Afghanistan. No one has ever been able to come to visit and totally decide to stay. Not Alexander the Great. Not the British, who considered their whole colonial operations. They just looked at it as the great game. Just a game to them. The Raj in India, just part of the great game. The Soviet Union tried the great game. That didn't work out so well. W. and Cheney thought they could play the great game. And whether Biden will admit it or not, we're still there. One of the Taliban used the phrase again to remind us, hey, our country always has been the graveyard of empires. Afghanistan became independent from the British August 19, 1919, almost 30 years earlier than India and Pakistan did. What does that tell you about how hard it is to maintain the place? 1933 to 1973, they had one king, Zaire Shah, who got the throne when he was 18, and then finally there was a coup where Daoud Khan took over, and the king fled to Italy and lived long enough afterwards that they brought him back after the Taliban fell in 2002 for the sit-down Loya Jirga where all the chieftains tried to figure out what to do. They brought him in to run the thing, if I recall. And then, 1978, I think Dowd was assassinated. It was a coup where the PDPA, an avowedly communist party, seized power under Nur Muhammad Taraki. One year later, another coup in Taraki is murdered, and Hafizullah Amin takes over. Then, the Soviets, fed up with the chaos of their newfound satellite, they invaded and killed Hafizullah Amin, and installed a wacko named Babrak Karmal, who shortly thereafter, they took him out and killed him, and put in a guy with one name, Najibullah, after that. Meanwhile, over in Pakistan, their intelligence agency, the ISI, was helping to organize people who had fled Afghanistan, refugees and others, and had been given schooling in hardcore religious schools called madrasas that were mostly financed by Saudi Arabia and started organizing them to drive out the Soviets. I keep wondering, what did the Soviets even want with Afghanistan? It's a ways from a deep water port. You gotta pipe oil from the Caspian Sea Basin through all those mountains and get through all those local guerrillas and then you have to go through Balochistan, which neither Pakistan or Iran has ever been able to control. Then you hit the water. I don't know what they were thinking with that. Eventually, the Mujahideen did drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan. And by then, they were our golden boys. We didn't care what they did on their own time or what they did to women or anything like that or whether they were a bunch of bandits. We didn't care, but it actually gets worse. In 2001, Jimmy Carter's old national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the father of that ice-cold bottle blonde who co-hosts Morning Joke on MSNBC, he bragged in a French interview that we and the ISI started financing, training, and organizing those Mujahideen guerrillas six months before the Soviets even invaded. We were trying to goad the Soviets into invading and preaching this concept of jihad on these guerrillas we were training. A hundred thousand of them from 40 countries went through our and Pakistan's training, hoping that we could then play our own great game and expand a holy war all over the Muslim world, especially all the countries still trapped inside the Soviet Union. 
He still thought it was a great thing. It became their own Soviet Union, and besides, the dope is pretty good. This is all detailed at greater length in my old spoken word album I put out in 2002 in response to 911 and the invasion of Afghanistan. There's a ton of stuff on it in there, and we still have the vinyl, and we still have the CD. So yes, product placement it is. I'm just summarizing my own research there. What we really did was wade into not a 20-year war, but a 50-year war, a lot of which we actually caused. Rank and file were unaware in the Mujahideen, their jihad, that's not they were fighting for, they were actually fighting for Uncle Scam. Well, we were equally unaware that we were recklessly arming and financing a future war against ourselves. And this wasn't Reagan who did this, this was on Carter's watch. Finally, the Soviets did pull, pull out, and did we go in with a Marshall Plan, rebuild the place, help get women educated or anything like that then? No, we just left them in the lurch, and just like this time, we didn't collect all those weapons, all those machine guns, all those rocket launchers and things. We just left them in the hands of all these different warlords who never thought much of each other in the first place. They just wanted the Soviets out, thus ensuring a multilateral, all wild civil war estimated to kill between 562,000 and 2 million Afghans, almost all of them civilians, because we didn't stay like we did after World War II and helped the people we'd used out. What they called it there was the Great Betrayal, where things got so out of control and so many people were getting killed for no reason and so many people caught in the crossfire that a guy named Mullah Omar in Kandahar in 1996 put on a cloak in front of 50 people that he called the cloak of the prophet Muhammad and proclaimed himself commander of the faithful. And within a year, those 50 people had grown into the Taliban that seized the whole country. Why? What made them look so good? These warlords we gave all the guns to who were killing each other endlessly. The Taliban restored order. It was brutal, it was horrible, but they did restore order and that's why people supported them. So yes, when you look at that and all those arming of the Jahideen without bothering to keep track of them, and some were from Chechnya and other places who took their jihad there. We are responsible for the Taliban ever coming to power in the first place. It's, there were ours. It's our fault. It's the blob's fault, and it's about time we owned that.